Welcome to Just Plain Fun. I'm one of the JPF kids and I will be co-hosting today's video with my dad, MJ. My dad, MJ, will be answering some of your guys' questions. The most commonly asked question my dad gets is, how long has have you been doing this? That's a great question, JPF kid. That is absolutely the uh, most common question that I get, whether I'm selling at a flea market or if folks come over to the shop, they want to know, you know, how long have I been doing this? I think it's because I just have so many daggone parts and they wonder how, how I managed to amass so many. But the answer to it is that I've been into hand planes for about five or six years now. And as far as doing the, the parts side of things and trying to supply parts all over the world, I've really been at that for about two or three years now and have really, really gotten serious, I'd say, in about the last year and a half. Miss Janet asks, when is a hand plane worth restoring versus when to scrap it? All right, Miss Fletcher out in California, that is a fantastic question. And the first thing that I always encourage folks to think about is, you know, what is the accessibility of hand planes? Is it the kind of thing where you can go to a flea market virtually every weekend, like say you live in the Northeast or even you live in anywhere, Pennsylvania, Vermont, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, any place like that. There are a ton of hand planes in that area because, you know, let's face it, they didn't really travel that far away from Connecticut. So if you have access to a lot of hand planes, you can be more selective about what you restore and what you scrap. And then vice versa, if you live in, say, a tool desert, and I don't know exactly where the tool deserts are, y'all know, but for example, Oklahoma, I don't really see a lot of folks buying and selling a lot of planes out of uh, out of Oklahoma for whatever reason. And I'm just using that as one example. If you live there, don't be offended. Um, and also the amount of time that you have to put into restoring a hand plane. And then, of course, as I've talked about in other videos, you know, you've got collector hand planes versus users and, you know, of course, cost is always a factor. So let me just give you all an example so this right here is a plane that was broken and it's been brazed back together. I don't think that this plane is ever going to be right. I mean, the braze looks halfway decently done, but in this day and age in 2021, to me, there's no reason to save a hand plane like this because there are other intact hand planes that are still available. So in this particular case, I am actually going to scrap this, Miss Janet, but look at that. It's a beautiful intact rosewood tote. And so that will end up going to another hand plane or being sold and going to another hand plane for someone else. And then, of course, the brass, the frog, that kind of stuff will all be saved and repurposed to live another day with another hand plane. One like this, I mean, I think that's kind of a no brainer. Naturally, no one, I don't think anybody's going to try to save that. You know, somebody made a comment online about, you know, cutting the back of that off and making it a smoother but there's so many other incomplete hand planes out there that it just makes more sense to take the good parts off of this one and put them on a better plane. This is another common thing that you see. Usually this is where a plane was maybe put upside down in a vise. Maybe it was somebody was, you know, doing something on the bottom or for whatever reason, that's a common thing. Or it just got dropped and it hit. And when the cheek hit the, the floor, it cracked. To me, Again, not worth saving. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. As a matter of fact, this one might end up going up to Greg Ricketts so that he can make a, a, a cutaway model out of it. So I'm not going to save a hand plane like this, even though it's a bedrock, but you might have a different idea with that. Again, accessibility because, you know, what other parts are you going to need to replace? Obviously, the, the handle's bad on this one. You know, did the frog get damaged when it fell, et cetera, et cetera. Here's another one that's been brazed and this has actually been brazed on both cheeks which to me is kind of a death blow i'm not going to go after a plane i'm not going to try and restore one that has been clean broken in half could it be restored sure but you know just like i mentioned on the other ones i'm probably just going to take the parts and use them for another hand plane so i've shown some examples of ones that i wouldn't necessarily save and this is one that i would or that i that i plan to so this one has a little hangy hole back here which are no good for collectors, but you know, they're not bad for users. It's not gonna hurt the usability of this plane. So the cheeks are still intact and everything. All is well on this plane, no cracks around the mouth right here, which is unfortunately fairly common. 
So this is a plane that I will save. I'm going to end up, you know, either cleaning it up, putting some good furniture on it. May or may not get an intact original bedrock cap. We'll have to see about that. But this will make a fine user. And specifically with the hangy hole, I've heard tale of folks filling that in with JB Weld. I've also heard of folks either threading that, say, with a tap. And then actually putting a bolt in there and then cutting it off. You know, cutting it off even with the top and bottom there. Same thing with the JB Weld. You would just, you know, clean it up. But basically, you know, filling that in. And then if you were to go as far as either, you know, painting it with some enamel or doing, you know, original Japanning, then you're not even going to know that that hole was there. And it's sure not going to affect usability on it. So definitely worth saving, in my opinion. And then this is one that I just like to show off because this is actually one of my user planes. And you can see where someone soaked it partially in, whether it was vinegar or that's most likely considering the pitting there. Um, and it unfortunately didn't get completely submerged. And so it kind of jacked it up. And then the lever cap has been repaired and not a really fantastic job on it. The tote is damaged. And as you can see, the mouth has been widened, but you can tell by that, that iron there, this is one that I use as my dedicated scrub plane. You can see all the Japanning is gone. So it's the ugliest hand plane around, but it's also the hardest working hand plane. And so it's just an example of, you know, kind of not giving up on one. So really, no matter how much damage it has, if it's still usable in some form or fashion, you could make a scrub plane out of it. But note that this is not any kind of collectible hand plane. I mean, it's just a, a later model, you know, probably like a type 16 or something like that. All right, and the last example that I'm going to show, I mean, I could show examples of, of this all night, but I think y'all get the idea. But the last example that I'm going to show is this one right here. You can see that that has some significant pitting. I mean, that iron on the side there is just, I mean, it's completely jacked, as is the bottom. You can see there. So this plane has been through the ringer. But for those of you that are spotting your, your key clues, you see the beading on the knob there. You see the solid brass adjuster, and if you can make out the, the writing on there, and you see the big fat base on that tote right there, and then the old school Stanley rule and level. So all the key, the clues are there, and if you know, you know, but this is actually a type 1 slash type 2 Franken plane here. So you can see that's actually a type 2 lever cap. And technically, this would be a little bit later iron. I don't have one quite that old. But this is a plane that no matter, virtually no matter how bad it was messed up, no matter how much damage there is, in this case, all that pitting on the body, I would never scrap this plane just because the initial run on the Type 1s, and it is a Type 1 body, by the way, was, I think, what, 6,500, 6,700, something like that. Um, so less than 7,000 of these planes were made originally in, you know, late 1860s. So this is one that no matter how bad it was damaged, of course, you would still restore it. So that plays a role in it as well of how collectible it is. So Miss Janet, I hope that answers your question. And I know you asked it really on behalf of other folks that might not know. And I guess let me throw on one more additional idea here or one more thing to, to ponder. It's not just about the body. Sometimes it's about the parts as well. So this is a number two frog that has been damaged. So when it comes to number twos, they're just about always going to be savable. But you have to think about cost for what you're going to spend on one. Because when you start talking about replacing broken parts, especially on the number ones and number twos, you could, you could easily, easily end up spending more than the plane is worth just trying to get it back and serviceable again. So definitely something to keep in mind. Wow, that's an amazing answer, Daddy. <laughs> Mr. Steve would like to know what key indicators to look at when purchasing a hand plane. Once again, that's a great question, what to look for. And what I want to do is I want to invite everybody to go back and watch my video on things to look for when buying your first hand plane. So if you scroll through my videos, you'll find it quick. But I don't mind covering it again and you know maybe taking a, a different look at it. I'm going to refer back to the same thing where I talked about if you live in a tool desert, then, you know, you're not going to be able to be as selective. But if you live in an area where you can go to yard sales, you can go to flea markets, you can go to estate sales, 
and you can actually hold these planes in your hand, then these are the things that you're, you're going to want to look for. Remember I talked previously about the little cracks. <clears throat> if you can, and you can even take a razor blade with you, and as long as the seller is okay with it, you can scrape the bottom. But you always want to look for those little cracks, those little hairline cracks coming from the mouth, because that'll really hurt the value and the usability of a plane. This one has been brazed, and that is one of the better brazed jobs that I've seen, where they really did a good job of squaring that up. Unfortunately, that crack kind of kills it, but you get the idea there. And another thing, just like we talked about previously, you want to look for other broken components besides just the body. One of the things that I hear and see a lot online is folks will see a frog like this, and sometimes even a cross profile or a side profile, say online, and they'll think that that's a pre-lateral. And really all it is is just the lateral adjust lever has been broken off. So this is a pre-lateral, it's for transitional, but this is a pre-lateral. You can see where it's smooth all the way across and there's no place where the lateral adjust would have been. So super important to look for laterals if they're there, because honestly, the lateral adjust lever is the key component that you want to look for. When you see this right here, chances are that's either going to be a late model Stanley, as I'm going to show you here on this Type 20 here in a minute, or maybe even a handyman, or it's going to be some other off-brand. So when you see that split or U-shaped lateral like that, that is a strong indicator. And that's one of the things that you want to look for because it's really an easy way to differentiate between different brands. So this one right here is going to be either a Craftsman or a Miller's Falls when it has that the upside down L shape like that. In this case, it is a Craftsman, which incidentally was made by Miller's Falls. And that's a, a key thing there. Here's that type 20 that I was telling you about. It has the upside down U shape. So that is a Stanley, but you can tell by the, the blue in the bed. And that's a true type 20. Lots of folks see those, the C557B or whatever it is. And they think that's a type 20. That's really not. It's more of a 1980s version, I think. And then this one, the just god awful Pexto brand. Again, upside down U there. And then the stamped steel frog. So definitely something you want to stay away from, just like I talked about in the what to look for in, when you buy your first hand plane. As for what to look for is going to be that T. So when you look at the lateral and you see that two part lateral that has the shape of a T, then that's your strong indicator that that is going to be a Stanley. Another thing you might see sometimes is a twisted lateral. I don't have one handy. I'm sure I have them in the shop, but I don't have them handy. But it'll be similar. It'll have the disc here for adjusting the blade. But instead of the T back here, it'll just have a twist. And I'm sure most, if not all of y'all, have seen that before. But the lateral adjust is really kind of the key feature that you want to look for to indicate that it is a Stanley plane. Now, if you're into Miller's Falls, then, you know, no problem. Go after that. If you're into Union... You know, I know after the Stanley buyout, those had a twisted lateral. But as far as key indicators, that's what you're looking for. So as far as overall indicators, the frog is really a good place to look. The lateral adjust lever. And then you can also look at the blade adjustment knob as well. Because that can be an indicator of what you're dealing with. If you don't live in a place where... That one doesn't have one. If you don't live in a place where you can go to flea markets and say you're doing a lot of your shopping online, then you're going to end up looking at a lot of pictures, whether it's on auctions, if it's on eBay, wherever it might be, you're going to end up looking at a lot of pictures. So you have to learn to decipher what a plane is and sometimes by not so great pictures. So I'm going to go ahead and give y'all one hint or clue that you always want to look for. If you see a plane and the body on this one is going to be about seven inches long, those of you that know no, just by looking at it. But when you see the two ridges on the brass adjuster, the blade adjuster like that, you know that that's an indicator that that may be a type, or excuse me, maybe a number two. So, and then if the body is about seven inches long, if it's say sitting next to a block plane and the block plane, you know, is about six inches and this, you know, bench plane is about the same length, then you're going to have an, that's going to be an indicator that it could or is a type two. Same thing, or excuse me, I'm sorry, number two, number two. Same thing with the, the ridges there versus the three. So this is really geared more for folks that maybe don't have as much experience. But when you look at pictures online, that's the kind of thing 
that you want to look for. And even on a side profile, usually you can see if it is the T lateral. And you can always shoot a message to the seller as well and ask them if, you know, perhaps they don't know what they have. And so you can ask that question and try and get some more information there. All in all, I just want to invite everybody to go ahead and watch that video on, you know, firsthand plane because I really do cover a lot of this stuff. But like I mentioned, I don't mind going over it again, especially because not everybody's going to watch every video and I get that. But hopefully that gives you an idea of some of the key indicators overall on the hand plane. You want to just look for broken components because you got to be careful buying incomplete planes. Because sometimes the parts can end up costing more money, as I've mentioned a few times before. And, you know, feel free to reach out to me and ask, you know, how much is a replacement frog going to be? How much is it going to be for this, that? You know, and really a lot of the value in a plane is going to be in the handle, especially if it's rosewood. So if it's intact versus if it's broken, that can make a huge difference if you prefer to have an intact one. If you want to go ahead and repair it, not a big deal. You can, you know, but it's still going to hurt the overall value of the plane having an original versus a repaired one. And, you know, quite frankly, a lot of it just comes with experience. The more hand planes that you buy and sell, the more experience you're going to get and then you'll learn what to look for but hopefully that information will give you a good indicator to get you started okay daddy wrap it up it's time to get the next question mr justin is wondering where are the best places to find rusty gold that's another really great question justin and the short answer is it's going to be antique malls when the seller doesn't necessarily know what they have because otherwise a lot of times they're overpriced flea markets, yard sales or garage sales, and estate sales. So, and it goes back to what we were talking about before about where do you live in the country. If you're in the Northeast, there is rusty gold everywhere. If you live in a tool desert, it's gonna be a little bit harder to find in person. And so, just depending on where you live it, and how much time do you have. So, if you live in a tool desert, if you don't have a whole lot of time for going out hunting, say every Saturday morning or something, then you're going to end up back online. So it's going to be, it's going to be eBay. It's going to be buying from a seller like me. It's going to be finding stuff on the can I have it page on Facebook or the vintage tool patch. You're not always going to get those smoking deals. You're not going to buy, you know, $5 bedrocks there, but they're going to typically be affordable. But if you want to get those just absolutely smoking, screaming deals that you hear about, that you read about, then it pretty much boils down to being first when it comes to, say, an estate sale or a yard sale. So it means getting up at the crack of dawn or before the crack of dawn and being out the door. And you really kind of have to be aggressive, rabid, whatever you might want to say, in your pursuit of that rusty gold. It's not the kind of thing where you can you know, get up at 10 o'clock on Saturday and think that you're going to go out and find a, a sweet deal on you know, inexpensive hand planes. So I hope that answers your question. If you still have any other questions about that, or if you want, you know, want whether it's me or somebody else to expand on that and maybe talk about some of the places that they go. I don't think anybody's going to give up their honey hole and tell you exactly where to fish because they don't want to run into you out there on the lake, if you know what I mean. But that, that should at least get you started, you know, and if you live in a tool desert and you don't have access, then by all means, hop online and look for the different, auctions around and you know as long as you're willing to put in the time you're going to find the deals mr bud wants to know where is the gigantic pile of number 78 depth stops and fences well here you go bud i don't know where all the depth stops are i know i've sold about 20 of them in the last couple months but here's the big pile of fences that i bought from another dealer thanks for watching slap that like button and we'll see you in the next video